All right, great. Uh, good morning or good afternoon, everybody. Thanks so much for joining uh, our webinar today, celebrating our Social Learning Innovator Award winners for 2023. Uh, if we can move on to the next slide, please. Uh, I'm Joe Ferraro. I lead uh, the revenue teams here at Hypothesis. So that's our um, customer success, our partnerships, and our marketing teams. And I'm super excited to uh, celebrate some of our biggest users and folks who've made so much impact in learning and especially in social annotation over the last academic year. I think if we really take a step back. Social learning has always been something that we strive for. And especially over the last few years, we've seen education is transforming. And each of our winners, whether it's institutional or from an individual instructor level, has really shown that they're part of this shifting paradigm and helping students learn in any modality, anywhere, any place that they are. And so we've really gone through so many different uh, use cases and faculty and partners that have done so many incredible things over the last 12 months and focused on three things, innovation and finding ways to really reach students, how you can make an impact and really retain students and help see them help them become successful and also just improving the status quo and finding new ways to get really exciting resources into students hands particularly at a low cost and you know over the last 12 months we've seen millions of annotations from hundreds of thousands of students and tens of thousands of instructors and administrators just like the folks we're going to see on this call who have really you know made social annotation explode on their campuses. We've seen almost 4 million annotations from our students this semester. It's our biggest fall ever. And really the folks that we're going to talk to over the next 55 minutes or so are a big reason for that. Um, and so now without further ado, let's get down to uh, reviewing some of our inaugural winners. And so we've really broken this out into a few different categories. We've got institution-wide. We've also got uh, folks that are finding ways to improve outcomes, as I mentioned, and then also a variety of disciplines. I'll be the first to admit when I thought of social annotation, English and the humanities made the most sense to me, but we've seen some really, really incredible ways that folks are using social annotation to keep students excited, engaged, and help them continue to learn more as they really further their studies. And this group has really been integral in doing that. So uh, we are super excited to get things going and let you meet each of our winners. Um, and the way this is going to work, each person is going to come up uh, from their respective institution for five to seven minutes or so, talk a little bit about how they got started with Hypothesis and, you know, what it was they were trying to accomplish. Uh, we do have the Q&A section open in the chat function, so if you do want to ask questions to a specific person, we'll be able to get those forwarded up to them on stage. And so with that, let's uh, let's kick it off uh, with our first winner. I'm super excited to uh, invite Kim Grew from Northern Virginia Community College, who was our institution-wide winner. Uh, they have been supporting thousands of students this year, not just at Northern Virginia Community College, but also in two plus two programs across the state. And so with that, Kim, I'd love to welcome you, welcome you up here today and uh, learn a little bit about what you've been working on. And congratulations on the win. Well, thank you very much, uh, Joe, and uh, congratulations to everyone, and um, and I'm really happy to be here. I'm just representing Northern Virginia Community College. I am an instructional designer at Nova Online, and Nova Online is the online branch that serves our entire community college, which is the largest one in the state of Virginia. We serve over 75,000 students, and, um, and so if we were able to implement a hypothesis at a, at, a, at a higher level, we would have a larger impact, we believe. Um, obviously, we believe in the power of social annotation as a really strong, engaging uh, uh, practice, for especially for our online learners. It gives them an opportunity uh, to engage with each other and with the instructor uh, in a meaningful way around those texts. And so, um, so we really, um, we committed to the use of hypothesis and what we did, the way we run our online program is that we use the blueprinting system with Canvas. I don't know if y'all are familiar, I don't know how many people use Canvas for their LMS. Uh, it integrates so nicely, hypothesis integrates so nicely with Canvas. But because we're a, we use, we have, we're such a large institution, we use blueprints, which means, and, and I don't mean to uh, insult anyone who already knows all this, but we have like one template from which all the copies are made. And so one of the ways we were able to get a widespread use of Hypothesis, uh, we had several uh, courses that were uh, up for redesign, especially because we have a, a transfer of Virginia in our, our Commonwealth. We have a, 
like a lot of places do. We're trying to really align what's ha happening in community college with um, the path that students will take when they go to their four year. So we had a lot of these redesigns and, um, and we were able to implement hypothesis, which means if we implement a hypothesis in English 111, well, there are like about 50 sections of English 111 that run in one semester alone. So all of those students enrolled in all of those courses will have the opportunity to use hypothesis. And we were able to use the, uh, learn, the, the LTI uh, to, to make this happen. Uh, we did discover some glitches, some issues like around groups and things like that, but we're able to do small group work and on a really large level implement hypothesis using the blueprinting system uh, through, uh, through Canvas. So I really wanna give a lot of credit to our support team at Northern Virginia Community College um, at Nova Online in particular, because they're the ones behind the scenes who figured out that technology so that we could do group work and all of those courses and have social annotation embedded in all those courses, no matter what way the faculty wanted to use those. So I think that's the, uh, the big way that we've had an impact is that we've been able to, through Nova Online, really get the word out and then some professors who teach for Nova Online, they also teach for the campuses. And so every time a faculty member via one of these online uh, assignments that they have got some exposure to a, a hypothesis, we would see them start to implement that in their face-to-face -face courses. So that's just one approach. It kind of caught fire uh, by peer pressure and word of mouth. Um, and then also through our blueprinting system at Nova Online. So I don't really have any slides to share. Um, that's why we're here, and I'm just honored and proud to be representing Nova Online for that award this year. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Kim. And it's been so great to just see the usage really catch fire, as you mentioned. As you were looking to redesign these courses, what was the big problem you were trying to solve? It sounds like you had some pretty specific technical requirements. Well, uh, are you asking what technical issues we try to solve? No, I guess just what, what, what were they trying to focus on? It sounds like we did cross check a lot of your boxes on the technical side. Oh yeah, absolutely. Well, we just wanted, you know, we are about authentic assessment, OER, access, engagement, and engaging online learning. And so this tool really is one that is so simple to use and also does really boost that engagement, especially if it's used thoughtfully. I'm sure some of our colleagues here who are award winners are gonna be sharing the thoughtful, creative ways they use hypothesis, and I'll let them have that glory. Um, but yeah, to get more engagement in our online learning, and it's really increased um, uh, student interaction and engagement, which leads, as you know, to more student success, more people completing, more people passing, more people moving on to the next thing. So we just feel it has a really big impact Absolutely. And we're super excited to just see how things have gone this fall. Can't wait to see how the spring goes. And congratulations to you and everybody at the NOVA online team uh, on winning the institution-wide award this year. So thank you so much. And um, with that, we're going to actually move on. Kim gave me a good lead into OER. And I'm super excited to have Millie Gonzalez uh, from the Rotel Project, as well as Susan Tashin. And um, we were hoping to have Robert Awkward, but we've got Millie and Susan. So congratulations on your win with OER. It's I mean, the cost of education is something people are constantly focusing on. And I'm sure we're going to hear this a lot. Uh, Millie, we'd love to learn from you and Susan just yeah, how you found Hypothesis and what you were trying to solve with us. Thank you very much, Joe. If we can um, move to the next slide. So first, on behalf of Rotel, I'd like to um, uh, really send my appreciation and our appreciation because when we received the notification, we were just del delighted because as we see, um, one of the reasons why we partnered with Hypothesis, we saw it as the secret sauce uh, to, to allowing open pedagogy and making a, a big impact for our, for our community. So just a little bit about uh, the Rotel grant. Uh, Rotel actually stands for Remixing Open Textbooks Through an Equity Lens. And um, it is, we were funded um, by the Department of Education through, the, through their Open Textbook Pilot Program. Um, what's special about uh, Rotel is this is a, a wonderful collaboration of three state universities and three community colleges in Massachusetts. And the way that we set up Rotel is that we provide stipends to faculty 
We provide support through a publishing su uh, support team and then also individualized support at each institution. We also partnered with um, uh, and a number of training partners, including Rebus and, of course, Hypothesis. And then we also have industry input. Uh, highlighted in yellow are the goals of Ro Rotel. And uh, first and foremost, um, our intention is to remix and develop accessible, intentionally inclusive OER. And we believe that when we produce these textbooks, we will improve student learning outcomes. Um, and so the bulk of actually uh, most of the textbooks are going to go live in the spring. So we're very excited to see um, the impact that it has on students. And then also um, the wonderful applications of how they use hypothesis. Um, our goal also is to ensure the scalability and longevity of, of uh, the textbooks, not only throughout the state, but um, outside of the state and by heavily promoting and, and we appreciate um, also the recognition because that will definitely help um, promoting our textbooks. Uh, we're projected to uh, produce um, over 40 textbooks um, by the end of the year, uh, by the end of the next year. So lots of projected savings. Um, and then one of the things that we're encouraging is the adoption of the Rotel textbooks. Um, and so we're, uh, addressing gaps in the in um, high enrollment general education courses and then also high demand professional development courses. So that's a little bit about uh, the grant and I'm going to turn it over to my other co-PI Sutashian from Northern Essex. And uh, next slide, please. Sorry, thank you, Millie. Um, so as Millie said, um, the Rotel project team felt that it was really important to engage both students and faculty in open pedagogy through the use of social annotation with hypothesis. Um, so the faculty, um, the quotes that you can see on the slide are from English faculty, however, um, this tool can be used in any academic discipline. Um, and social annotation really offers opportunities for new knowledge creation by incorporating student voices, which was central to our mission of centering the diversity, equity, and inclusion in all of the Rotel um, textbooks by really making our textbooks relevant to the students at our institutions. Um, so what we like about Hypothesis is that students can not only annotate, but it also enables students to add supplementary materials that they feel are relevant to the text, like other art articles, websites, videos, images. Students can annotate a variety of texts, including PDFs, online articles, YouTube videos. Um, our faculty are particularly liking the um, annotating of the videos this year because it, students are not only able to see the video, hear the video, but then they're also reading the um, transcript. So the, the faculty feel like deeper learning is happening through that, through all three, um, you know, hear, see, read at the same time um, with Hypothesis. So, um, so they're really actively engaging in our new, newly published textbooks and course materials. And um, yesterday when I was working with one of our faculty authors who had incorporated Hypothesis into the Introduction to Literary Studies course, um, she felt that by using it this semester, it, the students were more collaborative. Um, it offered them a more collaborative in-depth experience um, by taking typical online discussion assignments a few steps further. Um, she felt that the social annotation um, allowed them to have more, you know, conversation around the text. So she's actually learned a lot um, from the students this semester. So our hope is that 
the more as more of our textbooks are published and adopted, more of our faculty will use hypothesis and more student voices will be included through social annotation through this technology. So we we just love it at Rotel. So thank you. And thank you. I can say it's been really exciting for us to work with the Rotel project. I mean, 40 OER textbooks in a year. I think you're going to have a lot of interest from a lot of different schools. I meet with customers almost every day and finding open resources is a challenge in a lot of cases and just making ways to make it more inclusive and more equitable for students. It's it's a really important thing and you all are doing great work. So congratulations to Rotel. Thank you. Thanks. And so next we've got our health and science winners. So I want to welcome Nick Denton uh, from The Ohio State University. All right, thank you, thank you. Yeah. And uh, maybe I can get a screen sharing while I introduce a little bit about what we do here. Excellent, thank you. So I teach uh, primarily in the undergraduate space in our Bachelor's of Science and Pharmaceutical Science program, in particular courses that we're dealing with uh, research surveys. So pharmaceutical science, what that research looks like, uh, cancer therapy, prevention, detection, what that research looks like. And one of the goals that we have in those courses is to introduce our students to that primary research literature where they can stay at the cutting edge of these disciplines, be able to take the methodologies they learn and apply it to their own investigations as they further along their career. And uh, you can scan the QR code available for an example of what we're doing here on a public uh, Canvas page. But the issue that we come across is that the primary research literature is not made for content novices. There is a lot of complex jargon in there. There are vague methodologies that we just do not have the word count to properly explain to our students. And a well-motivated student can spend eight hours reading a research paper cover to cover, getting through all those obstacles, and still not really get a grasp about what is novel about that paper because they were a content novice. Everything looks important when you read a paper as a content novice. And it's hard to pick up where we are in that scholarly conversation where you're jumping in partway through. So we saw hypothesis and social annotation as an opportunity not only to put those journal club readings on a more engaging platform, but also to leverage the expertise of the uh, content expert to guide students in that reading by seeding assessment questions in the paper for students to uh, answer while they're doing that pre-reading that really emphasize uh, what is the impact of that paper? What are some areas of focus that we should be on? Essentially just trying to fill that knowledge gap just enough that the student can successfully fill it with their own contribution. And likewise, the other two parts of that phase is that we also task students with posting their own question and answering a peer's question as well about that paper. That allows the exchange of knowledge between our students. So if one of them has a particular expertise on this topic, that really allows them to shine. And we're also, again, able to identify murky points in the paper that as a content expert, I don't recognize was an obstacle for my students. And then I can address that in phase two. Oh. Oh, so this is what the assignment page might look like. Again, very big on the transparency of teaching and learning. So make sure that the purpose, task, criteria are all laid out. I also like to include some headshots of the research team just to showcase the inclusive and diverse research teams that we have at OSU. And this is what it looks like on the social annotation where I'll put a maximum number of respondents so we don't have all the students flooding to what they perceive as the easiest question on that paper. And you can also see one of those interactions here that happened between two of my students where one of them may have been a little bit confused on where the macrophages were coming from the bone marrow. And then another student was able to reply to that question and help them along in their understanding of the paper. But what really shines is during phase two. And phase two is when we come back together and we have that journal club discussion. So now what I'm able to do is that I'm able to put my slides up on the screen 
I got the hypothesis board up on my tablet. And while we're having this discussion, I'm able to point out that, Robert, you had a really great explanation of what a Western blot is. Can you share with the class how the researchers were using that to answer this hypothesis? That kind of warm calling students into the conversation has been a complete game changer to what we've been traditionally doing with Journal Club, where at most we get two or three motivated students that's just dominating the discussion and everyone else is very disengaged and not really feeling the psychological safety to contribute to that conversation. So in my opinion, this form of social annotation models what is not just the typical, but the ideal journal club situation where we have the free exchange of ideas between our students, active discussion where I can get almost the entire class to engage in that journal club, uh, that journal club session. And together, we're able to just continue to cover those knowledge gaps as I fill in any misunderstandings in the hypothesis reading during that in-person discussion. And I think I may have just two minutes to maybe whet your appetite to some of the data that we generated for the upcoming uh, pre for the upcoming publication, where we have seen our students in those assessment answers demonstrate a level of comprehension where over a third of the students are bringing in outside resources to support their interpretation of that assessment. We are seeing engagement at a level where almost the entire class is engaged instead of the two to three highly motivated students. So we got more students that are getting a real feel for whether or not research and that primary research space is for them. And finally, we're able to develop these predictors of persistence in the science in our students. Uh, before and after we do our social annotated readings, we see the highest gains in student sense of self-efficacy, uh, project ownership in the literature, the emotional tie that they have to the scientific literature, and also the networking, whether they are talking to not just their peers and their instructor, but also friends and family about what they are learning in these primary research papers. And I think I'm at time, but I'll take any questions in the Q&A. Thank you. Yeah, uh, so it looks like we do have one question from Glenn at uh, Stan State. And so he said you limited the number of responses to specific questions. And I think that's actually a nice tip and trick for a lot of folks, because you always want to answer the easiest one. How do you do that? Ah, yes. So I'll, uh, <clears throat> in the assessment, put a number right before it, like two, this is the question. So I, so only the first two respondents to that question will get credit for completing that assessment. So that also kind of motivates students to get on these reading assignments earlier on, because then the assessment that they want to participate in will not have uh, the maximum number of respondents already. So it's been nice to see that dynamic switch around as well. That's amazing. It's, it's always great to see data, especially when you think about retention. I came from a science background and persistence is a big problem. So finding ways to keep them confident, especially when you put these large, pretty heavy readings in front of them early on, it's really important to keep them engaged. So congratulations, Nick, and thanks for joining us today. Mm -hmm. And Joseph, I would uh, love to share a copy of the slides with you all. So um, I'm sure we can facilitate that. Happy to do that. All right, thanks. And so next we've got our next winner, and uh, that is our administrative winner. That's Fatma Elshabakshi uh, from University of District of Columbia. So welcome, Fatma. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm Fatma al Shabakshi. I'm the, the uh, acting director, Center for Advancement of Learning at the University of District of Columbia, UDC. Uh, I'm I'm really both excited or honored to be here to share our journey with social annotation, uh, and um, I, I will be discussing uh, several strategy that we have uh, taken in order to really to create learning community. Uh, our center is focused on uh, really uh, providing a space for the faculty uh, for innovation and uh, creating a community of learning and continuous improvement. And one of our faculty actually 
pointed out hypothesis to me when I was a, a system admin administrator for our uh, Blackboard. Uh, and she told me, I want to just do pilot. I want to see how it works. And I, uh, I said, yeah, let's do it. And we uh, just uh, her course was a pilot. And I start to look at how the student interact in the course versus the discussion board. And I myself, I'm a diverse learner. Uh, uh, I came, I don't like the traditional class, cra classroom. I don't like the discussion board necessary. So that was like enlightening when I saw how the interaction, and that was like two and a half years ago, or maybe three years ago, right before the pandemic. Uh, so, uh, and that was uh, enlightening for us. Uh, and we adopted, uh, we, uh, we got a, a site license, uh, so to uh, to help the uh, increase student engagement and enhance learning outcome. So uh, so our goal uh, is beyond just increasing adoption. Our goal is focus on cultivating a community uh, to dedicate of continuous learning, exploring innovative application to enhance engagement and increase learning outcome. Uh, so we we did we did some different strategy to be able to uh, uh, reach out to faculty. So one of them is uh, we launched uh, a, an e-newsletter and it called Cal Learner. And I'm more than happy to provide a link and or you can go to our website, you will see all the archives. And the newsletter is spotting, uh, spotlighting uh, in innovative faculty practice and providing a platform also for professional development opportunity which promote faculty to faculty uh, webinars and fostering cross-disciplinary collaboration rather than my office and instructional technology or instructional designer recommend the technology. The faculty recommend the technology to other faculty. So they are in the spotlight. They share their pedagogy and how it works for our student and what works and what doesn't work and what kind of prompt that will uh, enhance the, uh, the activity. Uh, so the highlight for the newsletter, it will be all around all learning technology. Uh, other, other way of uh, uh, um, uh, strategy, we have a lot of certificate program uh, that the faculty, uh, uh, some are mandatory and some of optional. So we integrate in all our certificate program, the uh, hypothesis. So it gives the faculty uh, a kind of firsthand experience uh, at, uh, to use the technology as a learner, so to empower them to use it in their uh, in their teaching. So you have a lot of faculty, they will email us, what this technology that you use for this specific activity, because it really resonates for them. Uh, so, uh, and from there, it will uh, 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 um, kind of increase. So they're using it in, whether it's online, high flex, or face-to-face, uh, across all modality, it doesn't matter. Um, another strategy that we have been using, uh, so lately we start to reform our distance learning offering and we align our design with the quality matter standard, but we created a, a sec that different another standard, we call it UDC standard for student engagement. Uh, so, and that uh, focus on elevating student engagement in learning courses. So I'm not, I always say, I don't want to see a lot of discussion board everywhere. So diversify your uh, uh, technology in your classroom. And it doesn't to go wild, but you can just use, we recommend using hypothesis. So most of our online courses now that it's redesigned using hypothesis in many aspects. Uh, another a strategy that we uh, partner with faculty, my office partner with faculty for in research and writing scholarly articles. So if you go to faculty focus, uh, we have two articles uh, uh, published there along with the faculty. So the faculty bring in the pedagogy and the technologists uh, bring some of the instruction on what they see in the back end. Uh, and that innovative approach, sometimes it really helped the faculty to engage in uh, in the discussion, what, what why it's the best uh, use, uh, and we highlight it also in the newsletter, and we provide a, 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 a professional opportunity, a professional um, development webinar to talk about uh, the process of writing this article, um, uh, and I can send the articles and also send the newsletter link for everybody uh, to use, um, and I, to sum it up for that. 
one of the things that we focus on, we faculty are the backbone of the university. So our center is just to, for them to come with any innovative idea. We welcome to explore it with them, research it, and we go above and beyond to help them out to really uh, um, do what needs to be done and even go beyond what maybe thought they will be implemented. Uh, so hypothesis was one one is still one of our uh, big learning technology at UDC. We love it. And thank you for that. And congratulations on the QM certifications. And I love that you've built your own. It's you need to really hold yourself to a super high standard when you think about online learning. Uh, especially because you started using hypothesis before the pandemic and you've talked a lot about the different modalities. What have you seen in the way that students have, the way students learn has shifted over the last three or four years? Yeah, everyone in, in now in, uh, uh, moving forward digital learning. Uh, so even in classrooms, uh, there was another article I wrote for technology uh, um, a magazine that how our classrooms is different now than what we used to. Uh, that it's not even, we can't have a projector anymore. We need to have a smart boards because the use of hypothesis, believe it or not, because faculty, when we went, when they went back to classrooms, claim our classrooms back, oh, but we need to use hypothesis in face-to-face -face classrooms. And that would go with, students have uh, laptops in, their, in the class and we would have a smart board. So uh, the, the faculty, the pandemic, it was, um, accelerate our uh, teaching methodology, but we also, uh, we want to make sure our uh, infrastructure are, are um, aligned with the digital teaching and learning. Yeah, it's it's amazing to see how you've been able to keep, keep pace ahead of the curve. And uh, I know there's a lot of folks that would love to see that newsletter and how you get folks to adopt a new tool because there's so many and there's a lot of resistance for sure. But uh, congratulations, Pavla, and thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you. Awesome. Then uh, we've got our next winner, and that's uh, Laisha Palin from University of Colorado Boulder. Good morning, Laisha. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you so much for this award hypothesis. I really appreciate it. I'm Laisha Palin, and I'm a professor of information and computer science at the University of Colorado. Um, I, um, well, let me just say by, by way of my... Um, area affiliation that I was part of the early days of hypertext and hypermedia research in the in the 90s. And so um, I've known for a long while the theoretical potential of hypermedia and hypertext and what we now call social annotation beyond what we see in the web. And I've just been waiting, I had been waiting for a commercial solution to come along that was easy to use, flexible, and integrated with Canvas or that's my particular learning management system. I'm sure it's integrated with others in such a way that it really made it possible to um, pedagogically think about readings and what could be done with them differently than we had before. Um, and, you know, my experience, like so many others and probably so many in the audience, is that students don't read unless they have to be, unless they're motivated to do it. And they're not bad for having, not wanting to. I mean, I, this isn't a new thing. And I think this is an audience that's probably very sympathetic to students. But I'm just so tired of hearing that sort of negative spin of, ah, students don't do the reading or they don't do the reading like they used to. Well, I'm here to tell you that as a college student of the 80s who went on to become a professor and do research and all these and, and all these other things, I also did not read um, as much as I needed to. And I remember very clearly a moment in a, in a class where my professor asked to meet with me because he had assumed that I was keeping up and doing all the readings, which I hadn't been. And he was a MacArthur fellow. I just want to add that. And he asked me, Laisha, how do I get other students to do the readings? I really need them to do the readings. And I had to like cover because I hadn't done the readings either. And I didn't have any good ideas to offer him. But that mo that idea, I mean, that almost 40 year old idea, 35 year old idea really stayed in my mind as I, of course, well, as I grew into my own teaching practice and then in an, this very recent ability to adopt hypothesis and solve that problem that I was faced with as myself, a student. So like Nicholas, I feel very much like, you know, students aren't born, people aren't born, you know, dying to read complex research papers that themselves sit in a long lineage of literature that, you know, on their own, 
may or may not have that impact that it might feel to us as instructors or researchers who pluck that one paper out and say, ah, this is it. They just don't have the context for it, nor should they. And they're busy people. So many people, students are working and putting themselves through college. And so when something has to fall off the, the to-do list, it's going to be the things that are um, one does privately, you know, individually. And, you know, and, and I assume that students feel like I'm just going to take the hit, alas, because I can't make this all work. Not that they don't necessarily want to learn. And so what I liked about hypothesis after finding it is that I was able to approach my own practice. It took some time to really, took me about three semesters to kind of evolve into the practice that I really feel is crack the, has cracked the code of, of really making it a kind of winning formula. And it's very, very similar to what Nicholas is, is doing, which is, which is, which is nice. Some variations on this, but, um, but in my mind, whatever classroom I face, sometimes I face lower division students, sometimes I face a, a classroom of graduate students. And so I think about that population um, and I think about, and the material they're trying to learn. And I think about what, if I could sit side by side with them and read and coach them through, coach them through a paper, what would I want them to know? Where would I ask them the question that is that moment that, you know, gives that insight? Where might I say in this paper, ah, this is a lot of background here. Here's the simple version so you can get on to the next piece because you don't need to deal with this quite yet, you know, as a sophomore, especially. Something I wanna add in my discipline of information and computer science and especially information science, which is a new de uh, department here at CU, is there are no textbooks. So we're pulling from research papers. And so it's none of it's pre-digested to kind of introduce and explain all the concepts that are then introduced in, in the paper. And so hypothesis is what enables me to do that for them. But anyway, I imagine that I'm the, a coach and that if I could read right beside them, this is what they would be hearing from me. And that is what governs and guides my annotation practice, my, my prompts where I'm asking them to reflect, answer questions, or do something as a result of having read that particular uh, piece, whatever it might be. So, um, and and as so many others here have said, um, the the you know, I don't throw this word around easily, but I would say that the experience, once I sort of cracked the code, um, is absolutely transformative in my classroom. And again, like Nicholas, I'll, I'll put some different words to it, but I think he was also saying what I'm about to say is that it's not just then that I know that, you know, this person and that person and that person did the reading and I can now individually assess them. It's that they all did the reading and they, they have the intersubjective knowledge that they all more or less minus 5% say on any one reading did the reading. And so they show up in class, a 50 person class or more or less, um, but they all know, they can look around and know that if I say break into groups or now we're gonna talk about this, they know they don't have to bring somebody along or they have to hide the fact that they didn't read in front of me or whatever. And like I did with my professor back in the eighties where I had to fake my way through it. Um, they don't have to do that. They did the reading. And what's great is that I then tailor I'll say the lecture, but the, the meeting experience, it's not always a lecture. In fact, I want it to be more dialogic based on the annotations that they made on the reading, if the reading is something that then drives what happens that week, for example. And so we, I don't have to redouble all the material. They got in the, in, the, in the paper and where they don't understand something, that's where I focus on. Or we want to expand into something new. Um, I can then just move on. But I know that it really has helped with my pacing because I have knowledge now of where my audience is. And for me, that's always been one of the hardest things about teaching is not knowing where my audience is, even though I try to understand it as best I can. And hypothesis has really un helped me understand from their point of view, how they're seeing and understanding the not only the reading, but the material and sometimes even the world because of the sort of topics that we engage in. So all of this has meant like uh, created a very warm classroom, I would say. And it's helped or it helps create warmth in the classroom. That's one of my goals. Um, it's changed the relationships between the students. Um, 
mostly for the better. I mean, they can also do things like when they're forming groups for group projects, I'm sure they sort of know, oh, this person's really doing strong work. I would like to work with them. And, you know, there's some, but they just have that knowledge and, you know, they do, they do what they will with it. There's certainly a lot of helping within the reading. Um, and then the other thing I want to say is that I think going back to my experience of being a student in the 80s, I really am a first generation college student and I just actually thought I was kind of a mediocre student. Turns out now that I'm on the other side of it, I realized I was a very good student. Um, and what I think the hypothesis does in incorporating it formally into the curriculum is that it helps students know where they are and then they can judge what they want to do with that. So students who might just think they're sort of like, I'm okay, and they only to only to learn that they're actually doing really excellent work. Well, they take a lot of pride in that. They, they become leaders in the classroom. I have a student who is now seeing herself as a possibly going into graduate school and just submitted some a bunch of fellowships. I think because she saw how well she was performing where that wasn't just a secret between her and me, right? And then I have another student who was, you know, a brand new, um, it was a freshman, and hadn't been exposed to critical reading. And he could see that he wasn't quite performing both on the grade, but also in relation to other students. But then he could model after them because he wanted to do better and wanted to learn. And so and so he he sort of upped his game by by his choice. And so it's it's just a it's a very nice thing in that it, it enables the the distribution of teaching and learning to be to to be um reordered and not just be a relationship that only exists between me and 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 any one student it becomes much more of an us uh kind of enterprise with people then deciding where, what role they want to have in their own learning and in the learning community so um this really has opened new doors for me you know as i've been at this is my 26th year at cu and i feel like i have fallen in love with teaching again um, and it's reinvigorated my commitment to the classroom in, in ways that I just really wasn't expecting at this stage in my career. So I'm just really grateful for it. So thank you so much. Thank you, Leisha, and congratulations. You said it took a few semesters to really crack the code. When did you sort of have that light bulb moment that this is working? Yeah, it was when, it was when I realized that students still needed to be coached through difficult readings. I think, um, you know, I was one of the, er, the, the earliest adopters of hypothesis on my campus. And so I didn't have anyone else to kind of look to. And I, um, you know, like everyone else, I'm a little bit busy. And so I thought, well, I'm going to put this in a hy hypothesis environment and ask them to annotate. And that'll be, that that should be great only to learn that, you know, you can annotate, but you can still skip around on the paper and not really read or not really comprehend. And so I really had to move readings from, I had moved readings from the background to the middle ground, I would say, um, maybe because I wasn't, I didn't, had never experienced a world in which readings could be in the foreground. Um, and then by, 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 I, I, at that third semester, I really figured out how to move readings to the foreground of the learning experience through, you know, through my own supportive annotations and question posing much like what Nicholas does. Um, and that really, I think, changes the changes the game where they see you in the paper in advance of them. Yeah, I agree. And I like what you said earlier that, you know, students, they're not not reading because they don't want to or because they don't have to. I spoke with an instructor at a school on the East Coast just last week that teaches a freshman English class. They've never done an online reading. They've always been taking notes in the margin of their notebook or in the paper. And it's a whole different world when you have any sort of online resource where you can't really have that tactile piece. So it's about finding ways to get students comfortable with the new environments. And it's it's been really amazing to see you do that. And thanks for participating in another yeah. one of our webinars today. Thank you. And willing to take intellectual risks. That's what we want students to be able to do, you know, with these research papers and suddenly become a part of a community that's 30 years ahead of them in terms of what they know. I mean, you know, and we're asking them to jump on in there. And so they need the scaffolding to get in. Sorry to tack on that, Joe, but that was like the other oh, little no. I had. Yeah. No, and I can relate with a group of such smart people. I'm 30 years behind everybody on this call, so I have to always try to figure out. <laughs> All right. Thanks so much, Lisa. Thank Congratulations. You.
And then uh, next up, we have Francie Quas Berriman from Cerritos College. Good morning, Francie. Hi, everybody. Um, so I use um, hypothesis in my readings in drama class. And, and uh, when I was first introduced to the tool, it really came as like a gift from God or something, because when I the first time I taught this readings and drama class, I expected to, to teach it in person. And then it was the pandemic and that didn't happen. And quite honestly, that first time teaching that class, it was a hot mess. Um, and I do have a slide, I think. Um, and this kind of demonstrates the problem that I had that I was providing resources and the play was there, but everything was separated that, you know, there was the play in one place and they were expected to do that reading. And then there, I provided them resources and information and there was a discussion board, but everything was very separate. And then I was introduced to hypothesis and I know it sounds cliche, but I thought, oh my gosh, this is it. This is the thing I've been waiting for. And I, I love Laisha's comment about being the coach, the reading coach on the side, because reading a play is a very specialized experience. And if you don't understand how that play is presented on the page, you, you don't know what you're looking at. And, you know, you'll see even students when they're trying to read a script that they read the stage directions because they don't understand those. This is telling you what to do, but you don't read that part. So once I had it in hypothesis, I could layer all these different things into the text itself, into the play. So I could help the students understand how to read the play. I could point out what they need to look for. You know, as you're looking at the page and you're looking at the text on the page, here's what you're seeing. Here's the cast list and this is what this means. Here is the um, setting and this is what this means. So I could give them all of that coaching so that they were able to understand how to read the text. In addition to that, a lot of the plays I've been using for the class are based on actual historical events. And we talk a lot about how art is used to portray these historical events and to make those the lessons from those events relative to a modern audience. So we can add in, I can add in resources that help them understand and make that connection, as well as video clips from performances. So for example, one of the plays that we use, um, there's it's it's called indecent and there's a lot of uh, different language uses because the characters come from europe and then they're here so when they're speaking their native language it's very clear but when they're speaking uh, uh english it, it's very broken and so uh helping the students understand the difference between those things even though it's english all the time in the play um so i could add all of that in for them to get them ready to read and then we have the discussion on top of that. And so because they have those they have those guidelines, that coaching, and they have those resources, the experience of reading becomes a much richer experience for them. And to say how transformative it was, the first semester I used this in the class, the success rate in that class was 100%. And I have never had that in my entire life. It was insane to me the difference that happened there. Um, and the students, um, I know, I can't remember who pointed it out before, but the students are able to add in video clips and they're able to add in uh, images and things that they find as well. And so it becomes a much more dynamic and exciting experience for all of us. Um, and I, so I've obviously been using it in the drama class, but or the readings in drama class, but I've also been using it in my freshman comp class. And again it's completely changed the game like with the videos that they can uh annotate now uh with the readings having them annotate uh essay prompts so then i know what questions they have before we even get started because the questions are popping up on the prompts it's just i have found this tool to be something absolutely transformative in my teaching in a way i didn't imagine i like i couldn't have imagined before Oh, I did have one other slide where I showed what it looked like. Um, this is from one of the plays. It's about the uh, 
shirtwaist triangle uh, or triangle shirtwaist factory fire. And as an example of one of the resources, I found an interactive 3D model of the building so that the students could look at the, the model and see how the fire uh, went through the building. So while they're reading about it, they may not be able to necessarily visualize what was happening in that experience, but using this resource, uh, this um, resource in that's embedded in the text now, um, they can better visualize uh, how that fire would have gone through there. Um, and then on this one too, I, you know, people are based on actual people, I'll give them information about the actual people so they can make those comparisons as well. So, and then one question I always get, cause it's the plays, they're like, oh, well, how are you doing these plays? So our, with the library, um, with our library, we've got the uh, licenses, the, um, so we've got unlimited licenses or so, and then they, the text gets scanned. So uh, yeah, that's how we're doing it. Awesome. Thanks, Francie. And I have to say, I saw that you teach the drama courses when I was looking at the Cerritos uh, usage. And I was like, this would be a perfect place for it, especially for notes if you're preparing. But just seeing the visual, it makes so much sense how you were able to do this. And congratulations and glad we were able to solve your problem. <laughs> All right. And then um, next, we've got Jennifer Young from the University of Alaska, our business and economics winner. Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Good um, so I am Jennifer Young. I teach with the University of Alaska Fairbanks Community and Technical College, mainly in their applied business programs. But I've got a wide variety of courses that I teach, uh, business law, employment law, income tax, and investing. So we've got a lot of um, really heavy content um, courses and then a lot of really heavy problem solving and mathematical related questions. And when I learned about Hypothesis, it was just last summer and I enrolled in the Hypothesis Academy just to learn more about what it was and was really excited to see some of the things that were possible by listening to uh, the other individuals enrolled in the Academy and also answering the questions and prompts throughout the process itself. So this came about the same time that we were really pushing as an institution, the RSIs, the regular and substantive um, interaction and courses, as well as open educational resources and or the no low, no or low cost um, educational resources. So um, this was a huge transformational semester for me. I was able to switch three of my courses to OERs. One of them, um, Income Tax, remained a publisher text, but we kind of uh, played with what we could do with that. So I was given the ability to print that text and put it into Hypothesis for the one that we use, the publisher resources. And the other ones, we use the OERs and um, posted that in there. And very much like um, Leisha and Francie, I went through and posed a lot of questions and a lot of clarification to the students, um, told them to skip this and uh, it was really interesting to see what their knowledge was based on questions and answers at the beginning of the readings versus at the end of the readings. So we did a lot of repetition for that. Um, but one of the things that I found is that many of my students are non-traditional students and they have a intense dislike for traditional discussion boards. And they did not seem to have that sort of visceral reaction to hypothesis. Uh, I saw a lot more interaction and these are asynchronous courses, but I found that people were logging in and making comments almost on a daily basis. Whereas the discussion board, you would see it, you know, at the last day of the deadline and it would really just be a cursory comment and then they would drop it. So we saw a lot of, you know, I don't understand this. Can you help me clarify it? Somebody would clarify it. They build on that. They would attach additional resources, articles, YouTube links. Um, they would uh, show their work on a problem if it was particular there. So that was really good. I felt like the classes really got to know each other on a more personal level. There was a lot more interaction. And I found there was a lot more of a personal connection between the students and myself that I hadn't seen in prior semesters, which was a really, really nice gift. 
um, there was a lot of communication. I have this personal stuff going on, you know, what can I do? And being able to work with each other was really, really nice. Um, some of the things that I did in particular was we would work on some of the, in the tax course, some of the questions in particular and work through those. So at each stage of the calculations, they could ask questions or clarify. So they knew why things were occurring and where they were supposed to be done. Um, in my business law course, I was able to do a jury selection exercise based on questions and answers and interaction with the students, which was really nice. And um, in the investment course, we did a lot of portfolio building and we had the students um, compete with each other throughout the semester in different investment categories to see who could come up with the best sort of portfolio. And a lot of them ended up investing on their own into those based on the information that they learned from the course. So I'm really excited about next semester. I'm gonna implement some more annotation on YouTube videos and integrate that with some of the um, Padlets and voice threads, I think, which will be really fun. And um, the next semester, I'm also going to integrate in some of those annotations where the students can create some of their own questions and answers to use to be, to be used for assessments and um, also give extra points for adding to the content, making it a little bit richer, because I found a lot of the OERs in my particular subjects are very limited in availability or um, outdated in scope. And so that's been nice to encourage that. But some of the things that I have seen um, is success very similar to Nicholas when he commented about that. The students have improved their grades in the course. Um, they have improved their understanding on assignments. I very rarely even count any points off on any of the assignments and assessments anymore because they are working together to know that knowledge before they tackle them. And I have seen an immense decrease in the number of withdrawals or um, uh, problems with advisors and making sure, you know, midterm grades are too low, you need to work on incompletes. I haven't seen any of those things and um, just more open and regular communication, which has been really, really wonderful. So I'm really, really blessed that this tool was available and I will be using it and um, integrating it into more ways in future semesters. Amazing, and thanks so much, Jennifer. Uh, I, I love that you did Hypothesis Academy. I'm gonna be giving it a plug in a minute, but I think you just gave a much better one than I could. And especially, these are pretty heavy topics, you know, business law, taxes, and investment especially for non-traditional students, it's almost like speaking another language sometimes. So you think this has helped really build that community and keep people engaged? I think that it truly has. Um, one of the things that I focused on is anytime there was something, a term used that they didn't understand, I would define it. Um, one of the things I asked of them when they did their annotations was, if you see something you don't understand, please define it. I ended up giving extra credit points very sparingly for things like that, but a lot of the students would respond to those clarifications and definitions and say, thank you for looking that up. That really made it a little bit easier to understand for me. So that definitely was useful. Amazing. And we can't wait to see how the spring semester goes. So thanks so much. And congratulations to everyone that's here on the call. Again, congrats to Kim and the Nova online crew. Congrats to Millie and the Rotel Project, Nick at OSU, Fatma at University of District Columbia, Leisha at UC Boulder, Francie at Cerritos, and Jennifer at University of Alaska. Uh, and also congratulations to a few folks who weren't able to make it today. Uh, Justin Hodgson at Indiana University won our Humanities and Arts Award. Uh, Ming Hui Hu at UC Santa Cruz was our Social Sciences and uh, Dr. Sarah Antonora at San Joaquin Delta College uh, was our winner for pedagogy. And thanks so much for everybody. Uh, but some of the good news is if you are a new user or are somebody that's just thinking about joining for the fall, you don't have to feel like you're alone. Uh, we have partner workshops for each of our LMSs that we support, Canvas, Blackboard, Moodle, and D2L uh, running through the spring semester. We will be sharing a link in the chat. Thanks, Christy, uh, if you want to register for those and learn how to kick things off. 
And also on our next slide, we've got Hypothesis Academy. And so this is a certified educator credential available for any of our subscribers and the instructors at their institutions. Uh, it's a two week online asynchronous course that doesn't just teach you how to use the tool, but also can set you up to scaffold your own annotations in your course. Uh, again, if you want to register for the next cohort, we've got two different versions of Academy. We've got Hypothesis 101 and Social Annotation in the Age of Artificial Intelligence, how to use prompts to sort of beat chat GPT where you can. Uh, and we also do have a great offer for non-customers for spring semester. Great time to test out new technology in the spring as you prepare for your next year's budget. Feel free to reach out to uh, our sales team to learn more. But I just want to thank everybody for joining uh, today and sticking a few minutes over. Thanks to all of our winners for making some time at the end of the semester. Uh, it's been really great to see, you know, whether it's online, on ground, hybrid, high flex, traditional or non-traditional students. There are different ways that you can use social annotation to empower your classes as well as your users. Uh, it's really just we heard a few themes from the different winners today. You know, it's not just building knowledge and helping students build understanding of the concepts that you're learning, but it's building confidence and efficacy in the material. And I think that's especially important today and building role models in the classroom so students can learn from each other and really build in that community we're all striving for. So just want to thank all of you for being such a big part of that. We wouldn't be here today without you. And uh, thanks again and congratulations on the win. Thanks, everyone.